Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. If there's one thing I've learned in all my years dealing with musicians, there are musicians and then there are artists. Here's how I tell them apart. Artists make art, of course, but they also have other interests. They have other pursuits, abilities, hobbies. Bono is an example of an artist. He's the front man for U2, but he's also involved in politics, activism, tech, and a load of other things. And everything he does is done with an artistic flair and the soul of a performer. Artists also make art, but it's really all they do. In fact, it's all they can do. They live to create art and are often, well, not very good at anything else. In fact, to put a fine point on it, they may be hopeless at life in general. Now, that's not a judgment or criticism. It's just how their brains are wired. They are on this earth with an almost supernatural ability to do nothing but create beauty through art. But this power comes with pitfalls. They might have trouble with day-to-day tasks like handling money, shopping for groceries, keeping a schedule, or being able to deal with everyday social situations. They may suffer from depression or anxiety, bipolar depression, They may be on the autism spectrum, and they may be prone to addictions, alcohol, drugs, sex. And if they manage to become well-known for their art, the insane pressure, crazy schedules, hedonistic lifestyle, and living in a bubble of fame can exacerbate things until, um, well, until things get very, very bad. I've met a few such artists in my life. And in my experience, there is no better example than John Frusciante, who, of course, is best known for his work in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. His life, both in and out of the band, and he's joined three times and quit twice, has been very long and very strange. This is part two of that journey. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. The Red Hot Chili Peppers and Around the World from 1999's Californication album, the record that welcomed back John Frusciante as guitarist after he spent six years turning into a hardcore heroin addict, a situation that saw his house burn down and health issues that nearly killed him. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and here's a quick recap of part one. John was this teenage guitar phenom who became a big fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In 1988, when he was 19, he was hired by the band. His impact was immediate, and his contributions to the Blood Sugar Sex Magic album in 1991 turned the band into global superstars. Unfortunately, he quickly adopted a rock and roll lifestyle, while simultaneously becoming angry and disillusioned with fame. So, in May 1992, in the middle of a tour of Japan, he quit, and for the next six years, he slid into a terrible heroin addiction and abject poverty. Here's a quote from the LA Times when they tracked him down in late 1996. His upper teeth are nearly gone now. They have been replaced by tiny slivers of off-white that peek through rotten gums. His lower teeth, thin and brown, appear ready to fall out if he so much as coughs too hard. His lips are pale and dry, coated with spit so thick that it looks like paste. His hair is shorn to the skull. His fingernails, or the spaces where they used to be, are blackened by blood. His feet and legs are pocked with burns from unfiltered camel cigarette ashes that have fallen unnoticed. His flesh also bears bruises, scabs, and scars. He wears an old flannel shirt, only partially buttoned, and khaki pants. Dried blood dots the pants. When that LA Times interview took place, John maintained that his life had improved since he'd turned to junk. I quote, I became a junkie and came to life again, and became happy and started playing music again. I just decided that without heroin, I have no control over what thoughts take over my brain. John barely ate, preferring to drink a high-protein supplement. And the room where he was staying at the Chateau Marmot not only smelled of urine and feces, but, let's be honest, death. When his house burned down, it was rebuilt. But then John didn't pay for it because he just didn't have the money, or could be that he forgot to pay. 
The bank foreclosed on the property, and he lost it. He'd accidentally given his last $2,000 as a tip to a cabbie. It was only when Flea and Anthony intervened that he was saved, thanks to some tough love and a lot of rehab. And when things turned around, he was invited back into the band. So let's pick it up there. John's second round with the Chili Peppers began in late 1998. The band was not in a good place. Flea was having issues. Anthony was battling addictions again. There were divorces and new babies and creative blocks. But with John back and with Rick Rubin agreeing to produce the next album and a new management deal, things were starting to look up, at least a little bit. At first, the idea was to make an electronic-tinged record. Everyone from the Chemical Brothers to David Bowie were approached to produce, but they all turned down the gig. So it was decided that the Peppers would go back to the approach of blood sugar sex magic. In other words, the punk funk that made them successful in the first place. And it worked. The Californication album, released on June 8th, 1999, was an even bigger hit than Blood Sugar Sex Magic, selling almost 20 million copies around the planet, along with winning a Grammy. If there was any doubt that the band's secret sauce was John Frusciante, those notions were completely erased with this album. And from what anyone could tell, John was completely clean. Here's a quote. I don't need to take drugs. I feel much more high all the time right now because of the type of momentum that a person can get going when you really dedicate yourself to something that you really love. I don't even consider doing them. They're completely silly. Between my dedication to trying to constantly be a better musician and eating my health foods and doing yoga, I feel so much more high than I did for the last few years of doing drugs. At this point, I'm the happiest person in the world. These things do not F with me at all. And I'm so proud of that. You don't know how proud I am. It's such a beautiful thing to be able to face life, to face yourself without hiding behind drugs, without having to have anger towards people who love you. There are people who are scared of losing stuff, but you don't lose anything for any other reason than if you just give up on yourself. Not only was John off drugs and alcohol, but he became celibate, abstaining from all sexual activity. And there was 45 minutes blocked off every day for yoga. Even as the Chili Peppers toured the world behind Californication, John continued to dabble with solo material. In 2001, he released To Record Only Water for 10 Days. It was still pretty avant-garde, but at least it was a little more coherent, mainly because the previous two albums were recorded while he was whacked out on heroin. The album had plenty of electronic elements to it, inspired by a new appreciation for bands like Depeche Mode, The Cure, and New Order. Here's a track called Going Inside. John's love of music was renewed. He spent hours combing through record stores looking for old doo-wop records because he wanted to study harmonies. He spent time watching a lot of Star Trek and hanging out with his girlfriend, Stella, the daughter of artist and film director Julian Schnabel. The only benders he went on were ones involving long stretches of songwriting. He discovered old-school punk bands like The Damned and The Germs, and his songs took on a sharper, more angular feel. Everything came together for the next album, By The Way which was released on July 9th, 2002. A few weeks earlier, I flew to L.A. and met up with the band in a hotel in Venice Beach. And they let me talk to John. He was slight, frail, tiny. Here's how things went. One of the things we had a chance to listen to, uh, a good chunk of it so far today, and one of the things that, that comes to mind is that, man, this is a California record. It right. sounds like California. Everything about it is California, with the characters that you got in the songs to the song titles to just the way the whole thing sort of flows, like sky, sea, ocean, all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. We, there, there, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of beauty to be found in in Los Angeles. There's a lot of, uh, and in California, there's just there's a lot of good um, there's a lot of good feelings in the air, and and we you know we we try to make ourselves sensitive enough uh, musicians. 
and songwriters to be able to incorporate where we live into what we do. It's just it. But at the same time, there's there's just sort of a, a balance between this 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 mellowness mellowness and this uh, you know being at peace with yourself with uh, a sense that things aren't necessarily always all right in L.A., in Hollywood, in California. Oh yeah, I mean that goes without saying. You know, I, I it's it's just that. For me, I, I'm a person who always tries to look for the good, you know, in wherever I am, <clears throat> and uh, and in whatever it is that I'm looking at, I I don't uh, I don't focus on on the things that are ugly to me in the world, you know. But that's I, all part of living in L.A., isn't it? Is that you got the beauty on one side and you got kind of the seaminess on the other side? Yeah, but I I I just. Uh, I really try to look to where there's beauty. I mean, for me, anywhere I am, really, to be honest, is is about you know my living room. You know, to me, to me, like that's why I can go on tour anywhere in the world and I feel comfortable because my hotel room, I have my CDs, I have my guitar. You know, for for me, for me, anywhere in the world is home. You know, because of that. But you know, the whole record was written in Los Angeles, and you know, every day. I drove down Hollywood Boulevard to to go to the rehearsal studio to write. I hate Sunset Boulevard, and that's why, even though it was out of our way, I always drove down Hollywood Boulevard just because I like the way it looks better. Um, you know, and and I I think you know a a, a musician and or a songwriter has to, you know, ha just has to have their eyes open to what's around them and. I just think it inevitably ends up being part of the music. You know? So all Chili Pepper stuff is is written, credited to all four guys. I mean, it's very democratic. It's very U2 of you guys. <laughs> um, U2 doesn't credit stuff to Daniel Lenoir and Brian Eno, too? Uh, sometimes they do, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I know those guys have a lot, as much to do with it as the band, sometimes more, from what I hear. Well, how about you and Rick Rubin? I mean... Well, he doesn't write the music. He doesn't play anything. He he more organizes things, you know. But as far as answering your question about the about the um, about the four of us, you know, writing everything, it's 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 uh, you know some sometimes some it, <clears throat> sometimes uh, sometimes you know it is just a couple of people and actually writing what what would be called the song. But in our band, we just we feel that a drum part or a bass part is or a guitar part, it's equal to the vocal or to the or to the construction of the song. It doesn't. All these things are are equal, and we want each person to really play their absolute best, and each person to be really to to have that freedom to grow and to really feel like they are equal. And we really do feel that each person in the band is equal to the next. So, will you, will you come into a rehearsal saying, "Listen, I got this riff, I got this groove." I don't know where it's going, but I think it's pretty cool. Let's see what we can do with it. Is that yeah. how it works? Yeah, well, well, I don't really say anything. I just like uh, check check it out. <laughs> you know, play, I just play, it. or I'll just be playing it at a jam. You know, but there's also times when I just come in with a whole song. You know, and I and I I, I know I have a whole arrangement. I just show everybody the whole arrangement from beginning to end, and it's often that's the arrangement that ends up on the record. You know. John was present for the interview, but there were times when he seemed to have trouble expressing himself in words. Not because he was high, but because, like I said earlier, he's an artiste. His first language is, and always has been, music. Danny the girl is singing songs to me beneath the marquee Over soul By the way I tried to say I'd be there Waiting for The Chili Peppers with the title track of 2002's By The Way album. And even in the era of Napster, that album managed to sell close to 10 million copies. So that's two albums during John's second tour of duty with the band. 30 million copies sold. All things were great, right? Well, when John Frusciante cleaned up and rejoined the Red Hot Chili Peppers in late 1998, and after two insanely successful albums, you would think that all matters involving John's membership in the band were settled. And they were. For a little while longer. And then it all went to hell again. Okay, hold on. Back up. We've, we've missed a record. 
John considered the By The Way album to be one of the best things he'd ever been involved in. He was clean, he was happy, and he was learning even more about the guitar by studying the styles of guys like Johnny Marr of the Smiths, John from Susie and the Banshees, and even Andy Partridge of XTC. Even an experienced guy like John is looking to learn new chords, new techniques that create new textures. And there, of course, is always new gear to play with. The songs were pouring out of him. He wrote and wrote and wrote during the By The Way World Tours. A solo album called Shadows Collide With People appeared. He wrote the soundtrack to the controversial Vincent Gallo movie, The Brown Bunny. There was a side project with some friends called Ataxia. And starting in June 2004, he released six solo albums in just six months, some of which featured contributions from his Chili Peppers bandmates. John and the band were back at it together in early 2005 to work on what would become the massive Stadium Arcadium record, a double album running more than two hours. It was actually supposed to be a triple album, but the record company wasn't too keen on that. But that was how many songs John had written. John tried new things with more completely improvised solos, different approaches to funky rhythms and incorporating some of the melodic lessons he learned from other players. Stadium Arcadium came out on May 9th, 2006, and it sold in the millions. It was the first Chili Peppers album to reach number one on the American album charts, and it was nominated for seven Grammys, and it won five. This song debuted at number one on the Alternative Rock Songs chart, and it stayed there for 14 weeks. Stadium Arcadium was another triumph for the Chili Peppers. So that's three albums in a row with John on guitar. Total sales for those albums somewhere beyond 40 million. The tour receipts were in the hundreds of millions. It was fantastic. And of course, it could not last. And yes, it was John who pulled the plug again. After the long Stadium Arcadium tour wrapped up in August 2007, the band agreed to take a nice long rest. Anthony was especially tired and needed the break. In the midst of that hiatus, though, the exact date is July 29th, 2009. John announced that he was quitting the band. All right, well, why this time? Touring had put him off balance. I quote, I had become quite off balance mentally those last couple of years we toured. As the tour went on, I got deep into the occult, which became a way of escaping the mindset of tour life. The occult tends to magnify whatever you are, and I was an imbalanced mess. The occult? Apparently. He got a little too mystical with his post-heroin lifestyle. We don't know any specifics, but he got into the dark arts really, really deeply. And when he decided that he needed to leave the Chili Peppers, the rest of the band didn't even try to talk him out of it. Words like relief were thrown about by everybody involved. And the thinking was, well, this is really it. John's gone for good this time. The official announcement was made in December 2009, the same time John's friend and longtime Chili Pepper associate and touring guitarist John Klinghoffer was named as his replacement. John retreated into making solo albums again. They were very electronic. He said he'd lost interest in traditional rock band songwriting and wanted to try something he knew nothing about. He even formed an electronic trio called Speed Dealer Moms, who released an EP in December 2010. I want to play you something from a 2009 record called The Empyrean. If you remember what some of those smacked out solo records sounded like, this one was much, much more coherent. Here is John covering the Jeff Buckley song, Song to the Siren. And it's actually very, very beautiful. That's just a small sample of what John did after leaving the Chili Peppers for a second time in the summer of 2009. He also produced an album by a hip-hop group called Black Knights. There was a project with his wife called Kimono Cult that was pretty avant-garde, but it was the solo stuff that took up most of his time. He was on SoundCloud and Bandcamp a lot posting new music. Some material was released under his own name, but there was also some material that used the name Trickfinger. In fact, let's play some of that. This is a track from a 2015 album entitled After Below. And yes, the guy responsible for these sounds is the guitarist in the Red Hot Chili Peppers.
John Frusciante and an example of the electronic experiments he was doing after he quit the Red Hot Chili Peppers for a second time. But then he changed direction again and joined the band for a third time. That part of the story is next. To review, John Frusciante first joins the Red Hot Chili Peppers in late 1988. He stays until May 1992 when he quits during a Japanese tour, falls into junkydom and poverty while releasing solo albums of uh, dubious quality. He cleans up and rejoins the band in late 1998 and hangs on for a decade while churning up more solo material in a variety of guises. Then in July 2009, he quits again. More solo material followed. Meanwhile, the Chili Peppers soldiered on with Josh Klinghoffer on guitar. He's with the group for two albums, I'm With You in 2011 and The Getaway in 2016. Both do well, but everyone knows that the best Chili Pepper stuff comes when John is with the band. But while he was off doing his own thing, he never really stopped being friends with Flea and Anthony. At first, there wasn't much contact, but eventually they started hanging out more and more. Then, sometime in 2019, John got together with Anthony and Flea with a proposal. After spending all that time working with electronic music, John had become excited about playing the guitar again. Could they possibly work together again? This was a surprise. No one had ever expected John to come back into the band. When he mentioned this, he started jamming with Flea in secret. No one else knew that they were playing together. But the musical connection came back so strong that it took about half a second for Flea to realize that John needed to be back in the band. Getting John back in was actually Flea's idea. When he brought it up with Anthony and Chad, it took another half second for Josh to be fired and for John to be reinstated in the Chili Peppers. That was really hard on Josh, but eight days after he was fired, Eddie Vedder hired him to be a touring guitarist with Pearl Jam, so things kind of worked out. John's return came at exactly the right time for the Chili Peppers because they were going through another crisis of confidence. They were kind of lost when it came to direction and inspiration. John fixed that. Writing a new album started almost immediately. Rick Rubin was brought back in as producer, and more than a hundred songs were written in short order. It didn't take long for all four members to be in a room writing songs together for the first time in 15 years. They wrote constantly from January to October 2020 as COVID raged all around them. As Anthony said, with the pandemic, there was nothing to do but write songs. Recording sessions started late that year and rolled into 2021. One of the first songs John presented to everyone ended up being the first single from a record eventually known as Unlimited Love. The song is Black Summer, and it appeared on February 4th, 2022. The Unlimited Love album contained 17 songs and ran for more than 73 minutes, the longest single album since Blood Sugar Sex Magic. It got mostly positive reviews and debuted at number one in 16 countries. This was the first number one since Stadium Arcadium, which, of course, was the last album that featured John before he quit the band that second time. So why join the band for a third time? John says he'd done some soul-searching, he'd grown, and he wanted another chance to do it right. To look at him and hear him talk, he appears strong and confident and totally together. There are apparently no hard feelings and no resentments. Words like brothers and family are being used in interviews. John's back, and everything seems to be right with the Chili Peppers world. Things were going so well that almost as soon as Unlimited Love was released, another album called Return of the Dream Canteen was announced. Another 17 songs spanning a hair over 75 minutes making it their longest single studio album. This was the first single. It's Tip of My Tongue. We've only just begun Funky months around the run Gonna, gonna, gonna get you with the tip of my tongue And when you walk away Here's a quote from John. I've spent half my life in the band and half my life out of the band. And I suppose that's what I needed to keep things fresh and to not feel like I was going to become one of those people I never wanted to become, who just sorts of keeps repeating themselves and gets too comfortable with the rock star mentality and the rock star lifestyle. On one hand, you want to be appreciative of the people who put you on a pedestal. On the other hand, you've got to keep your ego in check. 
You don't want to go around thinking you're superior to other people or letting you making them think that. I find that a juggling act, and I find ego a tricky opponent. So Chili Peppers fans are back to where they were between 1989 and 1992 and between 1999 and 2009. The classic Red Hot Chili Peppers lineup is back together. Everyone is cleaner and more sober than they've ever been. Everyone may be a lot older, too, but they're certainly a lot wiser. But the question remains, how long will this arrangement last? Will John stick it out from here on in? Or will there come yet another time when he feels the need to leave? No idea. I put the odds at 50-50, based on history, but we'll see, right? If you like what you hear on this show, there are hundreds of podcasts available. Just go to your favorite podcast platform and download away. Binging, highly encouraged. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok doing various things. Music news and information comes daily from my website, ajournalofmusicalthings.com. I encourage you to get the free daily newsletter so you're always on top of things. And email can go to alan at alancross.ca. Technical productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.